Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Shalesh Kaushal. He was educated at Yale University, John Hopkins University School of Medicine, and MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is board certified in ophthalmology and is recognized for specializing in inherited degenerative retinal and macular diseases. He is widely published. He's a peer-reviewed author. He's currently on the review boards of several leading medical journals, and he has a practice called the Retinal Specialty Institute in the Villages in Florida. And I could sit and listen to this gentleman for hours because he has so much incredible information about how the eyes work and what nutrients influence proper eye function. And so it was with great pleasure that I introduced to you Dr. Shalesh Kaushal. Hello, Dr. Kaushal. Hi, Cheryl. Good morning. So we are going to get started with our presentation. I'm going to mute my line, and uh, I'm turning it over to you. Cheryl, I just wanted to uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, share a little bit about the retina in the next bit and uh, some of the interesting things uh, that we're able to do both clinically um, in terms of diagnostics, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the therapeutics that we use. Uh, I'll use uh, dry ma uh, or macular degeneration as a prototypical retinal disease and how, how nutrition can influence uh, retinal function as well. Um, so, um, Cheryl, uh, if you can just come on uh, for a moment. I You bet. And to, would you? Uh, okay. Just yeah, I'm, a little, I'm trying to click a, to the next slide. And it's not working for you? Nope, there's yeah. a little arrow up at the very top of your screen. Yep, I hit that. A tiny little arrow, and you hit that, and yeah. it's not moving? Well, then let me do that yeah. for you. So, okay. Jennifer's, all right. Uh, there, there we go. There. All right. I don't know why And I'll just working. stay on, and I will just try to, I will go ahead and advance these slides for you. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, so this is a schematic of a human eye. Uh, as uh, many of you may know, light is entering from the left, and it interacts, uh, light first interacts with the tear film uh, in front of the cornea. In fact, that's where the largest refractive change occurs. Uh, we always think it, it's at the level of the lens, but it's really at the tear film. And what's fascinating is, is as we get older, we produce less tears, and one of the reasons why our vision may be affected as we get older is because our tear film degrades. It actually has three layers to it, and uh, even though I'm not going to be talking about it, it's a, it's a wonderful subject uh, for a separate conversation and the biochemistry of, uh, of the tear film. But then uh, continuing with the trajectory of light, it then passes through the cornea and through uh, what is called the anterior segment of the eye, uh, and then it enters a chamber, and then it, light interacts with the lens, which is shown there as that oval structure. Uh, and light is bent again further, and then it passes through an optically clear zone uh, in the middle part of the eye. Uh, that, that zone is actually filled with a jelly. Uh, it's called, the medical term is vitreous. And with age, that jelly uh, has certain changes that can occur. Um, but in any case, then light continues on its path, and then it has a chance to finally interact with the photographic film of the eye called the retina. The retina is no thicker than tissue paper, and it's attached, as you can see, to the inner wall of the back of the eye, that red structure, thin red structure. Now, um, there's a, a small blow-up uh, of the retina there, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail in the next slide. But what I'd also like to point out to the listeners is underneath the retina is the choroid. You can see that in blue. That's the largest blood supply in the entire body per unit volume. Uh, it's in the eye wall. The retina is actually the most metabolically active tissue uh, in the body uh, per unit weight. Uh, so, you know, Mother Nature being as, as thoughtful and clever as she is, um, has put this huge blood supply next to the, lar the most metabolically active tissue. And indeed, uh, uh, there's beautiful biochemistry that's been done to understand how the retina functions and also the structure of the retina as well. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on some of those a little bit later. Um, then 
the only thing that light does, as you can see in that uh, schematic, is actually light traverses the entire thickness of the retina. It's a clear structure, a clear diaphanous structure, and it interacts with those oblong and those colored cells. Those are the photoreceptor cells. We'll talk about that in the next slide in just a moment. When light interacts with those cells, it affects uh, these pigments, these photopigments, and it causes them to change their shape and generate an electrical signal. That electrical signal is actually collated um, and it leaves the retina through the optic nerve. So you can think of the optic nerve as the cable that carries light information from the eye and it, then it projects to the back of the head through the brain. So we actually see from the back of our heads um, that it, it's kind of prophetic that old wives tales, you know, that moms have eyes behind their, <laughs> their heads. I don't know who said that, but it's, it's actually partially true. Um, well, it is true. I mean, we all see from the back of our heads. Uh, next slide, please. What we see here is, uh, I, I couldn't resist, this is another slide of the retina. Um, that's what's wonderful about the internet. You can find wonderful pictures to, to, um, to potentially use. And this is just labeling the structures a, a little bit more in detail. And what I'd really only like to point out from this slide is you can see that there's also these blood vessels that are coursing through the retina. Remember, the retina is no thicker than tissue paper. And in certain diseases, like for example, diabetes or diabetic retinopathy in specific, uh, and also strokes or mini strokes of the eye, these blood vessels are affected. And we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, in the context of certain changes that occur in nearly every chronic disease of the retina, actually, frankly, uh, every chronic disease of age uh, in the context of macular degeneration and as well as some of these other diseases. Next slide. Here is actually a blow-up of the retina itself. Now, light is actually entering the eye from the bottom of the slide, and it actually has to traverse, as I mentioned before, the entire thickness of the retina before it interacts with these visual cells called the rods and the cones. The rods, uh, so this is, uh, even though it's a little bit of a busy slide, I hope uh, the listeners might remember the rods and cones. The rods are important for night vision and peripheral vision. And the cone cells, in humans, there's three different ones. They're not that color, uh, red, green, and blue. What that means schematically, that's the color of light they absorb, the wavelength of light. Uh, so in humans, there's three different types. And those, the cone cells are important for central vision and color vision uh, in all of us. And it's quite fascinating. As certain animals, say, for example, uh, mice, uh, they have cone cells or uh, visual cells, I should say, that are effective at absorbing UV light. And then there's animals that live out on the desert who have visual cells that are effective at absorbing infrared light. And so Mother Nature's designed that again uh, and, uh, to help the organism adapt to the environment where they live. Um, in humans, this is the typical array. Uh, in, in the average human eye, there's about 120 million rod cells and 6 million uh, cone cells. Um, that's just the ratio uh, that we have, so about 1 to 20 or so. Now, the, the other cell that I hope you might keep in mind from this slide is this cell uh, that's above the rods and cones, and that's called the retinal pigment epithelium, or pigment epithelium for short. You don't need to remember the name. Those are the nourishing cells. They nourish the visual cells, and they carry out all sorts of amazing biological and biochemical um, events. And uh, we could talk literally hours about each of these cells, but I, I just wanted to point out some of the critical cells that are uh, involved in vision uh, per se. Now, the pigment epithelium, the reason why I point it out is those are the cells that appear central to changes that occur in macular degeneration. It, they also occur in diabetic retinopathy as well and in other diseases of the eye. Now, above the pigment epithelium, 
Um, remember in the previous slide, I, I pointed out the choroid, that very large blood supply? That's where the choroid is. It's, it's beyond the pigment epithelium on the other side. And you may see this, or I think you can see this gray bar, uh, all of you. That's a membranous structure that separates that very large blood supply, the choroid, from the pigment epithelium. And we'll come back to that in the context of wet macular degeneration. So uh, in any, uh, just to review, uh, there's the rods and cones important, uh, the rods being important for night vision and peripheral vision, and the cone cells being important for central and color vision. The pigment epithelial cells are the nourishing cells, and there's, they sit on a membrane, that gray bar, actually the, the, the medical name of that membrane is Brooks membrane, and on the other side of that is this very large blood supply. Now you may be wondering, well geez, what are all these other cells? Well, those cells, once the light interacts with the rods and cones and creates that electrical signal, these second and third order cells that you can see here, they are important for integrating light information that eventually leaves the eye through, the, if you look at the bottom, the nerve fiber layer. That's part of the cable that forms the optic nerve. So actually, so it's interesting. So light has to traverse the entire thickness of the retina then it generates electrical signal, and then the electrical signal goes back outwards in the retina, and then through the nerve fiber layer to the optic nerve to the back of the head. Next slide, please. Okay, now for those of you who don't have a chance to look at a retina underneath a microscope, this is an actual human retina, and it's basically a real image of that uh, it's shown as a schematic in the previous slide. Um, what I really want to point out, and again, you don't need to remember any of these layers, is simply how elegantly Mother Nature has partitioned this re the, the structures of the retina. It's a laminated, integrated circuit. It's something I'm sure uh, Intel and many of these semiconductor companies would be envious of. It's phenomenal at its ability to partition function by layer. And we're not gonna discuss that in, in, in any detail uh, today. But it's just simply for you to appreciate how laminated or layered the retina is. I, I will point out, uh, you can see where it says outer segments. That's actually where the visual cells are. Those nourishing cells, the pigment epithelium, you can see those uh, uh, below uh, the uh, visual cells, and that large blood supply again, the choroid, you can see these cystic spaces, uh, that's actually where blood passes through uh, in the choroid. And you, those of you um, who uh, I think you can make it out just above the choroid, you can see this membranous structure, thin membranous structure, that's uh, Brooks membrane that separates the retina, we call it the neurosensory retina, from this blood supply. Next slide, please. Now, um, I always wonder when I make a slide like this, or I actually think about it many times, and the reason why I show this slide, again, is not for anyone to remember uh, all the details of the slide, but simply point out some of the amazing biological activities that occur in the retina. And it's just to impress upon uh, the listeners that, indeed, uh, there is so much biological activity in the retina that it requires this massive blood supply in order to uh, have appropriate metabolic and oxygen exchange, which is shown there uh, or listed there uh, under the choroid. Uh, I will also point out that because of this incredible metabolic need, there's even blood vessels through the retina, as I pointed out earlier. And I, I, there, I don't see any, well, actually there is two in this section, but I won't point it out at this point per se. So the retina actually has two blood supplies, the choroid uh, down below, and then intraretinal blood vessels. And those intraretinal blood vessels are what if, are affected in diabetes. And as I mentioned, mini strokes or strokes of the eye itself. Next slide, please. So uh, here's an accounting slide, as it were, and I've mentioned some of these things already. Uh, the first one I haven't. The, developmentally, the retina is actually a part of the brain. In fact, it's an outpouching of the brain if you look embryologically or study embryologically. I mentioned to you about the metabolic activity and the oxygen consumption. What I didn't mention so far, it's actually the largest concentration of omega-3 fats per unit volume in the body. It's even more than the brain. And so you might imagine, uh, as, as an aside uh, for a moment, and we'll come back to it later, that omega-3 supplementation, i.e. through fish oil or uh, through other um, 
products, right? Uh, one can imagine that it's important for the development of the brain as it is the retina. Uh, and in fact, the omega-3 fats that are found uh, in the retina are predominantly found in the visual cells, the rods and cones that I mentioned earlier. They're critical for the function of the rods and cones. And there's lovely, lovely research over the last 20, 30 years to demonstrate that fairly compellingly. Now, um, next slide, please. Here's some facts uh, as we start um, beginning to talk about a disease, uh, age-related macular degeneration. It's the most common form of blindness in the Western world. Uh, it's rising dramatically in the developing world, and indeed it's predicted uh, by epidemiologists and biostatisticians and other folks that it will approach that uh, of the developed, wor the developed world fairly quickly. Now, the... And indeed, actually, it's the number one cause of blindness in the developed world, uh, in the U.S. and Europe and so on. There's two basic forms. Uh, there are other forms, too, but uh, conceptually, one can think of two forms. There is the so-called dry form, and I'll show pictures, the, pictures of these in just a moment, where there are these inflammatory debris deposits called drusen, uh, they're sort of yellowish in color, not sort of, they're yellowish in color, and that's about 80 to 85 percent of patients worldwide. And then there's the wet form. Um, we now believe, uh, to the best of our understanding, that the dry form can then transition to the wet form. And in the wet form, there are abnormal new blood vessels that are growing within, underneath uh, uh, the retina, and for that, uh, those abnormal new blood vessels leak fluid or blood, but for that, we have wonderful new treatments, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, the last point is something um, that is uh, one of my own uh, pet peeves, and, and indeed, I'm uh, uh, finishing a, 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 a review that I'm writing about the future of retinal therapeutics. So uh, here's the point. So as a retina specialist or an eye doctor, when I see patients, I'm obviously focused on the pathology that I see in the eye and the retina in particular. But in reality, there's evidence, uh, old, lovely research that was done uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, to, that demonstrates that there are certain biomarkers, uh, proteins that are found in the blood, um, that suggest that AMD may be... And, nearly every retinal disease, uh, is a systemic disorder with local eye manifestations. So, uh, and how can we influence those systemic uh, changes? Nutrition is probably one of the most powerful ways to modulate or mitigate that. And as many of you uh, are aware, food is not only tastes good, all right, presumably that would be we all like to eat good food or, or tasty food, but it's, it's powerful information for cells. Uh, it directs the biochemistry of cells and tissues, and so we literally are what we eat. And uh, I know that's um, we hear that it may sound trivial at one level, but it has uh, biochemically it has very profound uh, ramifications and implications for both the, the normal functioning of a tissue like the retina, but also in disease states as well. Uh, those can be modulated as well. And we'll talk about some of those, as I pointed out later on. So what I want you to, uh, all of the listeners to um, remember is uh, obviously these two forms of macular degeneration, but, but to think or conceptually consider that the disease is actually a systemic disease. In other words, the kinds of changes, we'll talk about those biological changes in a moment, uh, the kinds of changes that affect the whole body, but they're, it just so happens because the eye is easily accessible and we can directly visualize the structures within the eye, um, that it's a local disease, right? So it's a local, it's a systemic disease with a local manifestation. And so it turns out Many, many chronic diseases of age, age-related muscle loss, age-related bone marrow dysfunction, age-related heart disease, age-related brain dysfunction, those also, in some sense, can be considered the same way. And that nutrition or nutritional biochemical approaches may be ways to mitigate the disease itself. Next slide, please. Now, now, this is a slide I always think about, <laughs> and I wonder whether I should include it or not. And I do, not to create complexity in someone's mind, 
our listener or observer's mind, but simply point out some of the critical pathogenetic events, right, those biological events that occur in the retina leading to retinal diseases. Now, you notice in this slide I don't use the word macular degeneration, but a, a, a more generic term, retinal or mac excuse me, macular degenerative disease. And what are those critical events? We know that oxidative stress, We hear, all of us hear about antioxidants all the time, uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, immune dysregulation, which, which may go together with inflammation, microglial activation, right? So microglia are these police cells that are found in every tissue, including the retina, uh, other forms, they go by different names in other tissues in the body. They're found in the heart and the liver and so on and so forth. That's also part of this uh, inflammatory response and these so-called toxic RNAs. That these are the specific molecules that were identified that can cause inflammation and or um, affect the function of cells, uh, in particular those nourishing cells, the RPE cells, and the visual cells, the photoreceptor cells. So all of these, these three, four pathogenetic events, which um, I, I list here in these uh, bluish circles, impinge on the nourishing cells or the visual cells. In the case of retinal and macular diseases, by the way, in glaucoma, there's a different cell. That, uh, uh, those cells can be affected um, by by these same processes leading to glaucoma. Um, and eventually there can be cells uh, that this leads to retinal cell death, and then the clinical manifestation of that is these degenerative changes. So by the way, by the time a clinician sees these types of changes in a patient's retina from macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy, very significant preclinical, in other words, when we couldn't see it, preclinical biological changes have occurred. And the whole idea of so-called, uh, uh, quote-unquote, preventative medicine is to influence potential changes that can become manifest disease, in other words, observable disease by nutritional mo modification or lifestyle modification. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is, uh, I hope uh, the listeners may, if, if of any slide, really, uh, this is probably one of the most important. And I, I, it's basically summarizing the, that schematic from the previous slide. As I mentioned, oxidative stress, inflammation, immune system imbalance or dysfunction, uh, those three events lead eventually to the death of photoreceptor cells. Now, why do I say death of photoreceptor cells? Well, um, that's when vision's affected, when the photoreceptor cells are either dysfunctional or out, frankly die. Now, if they're dysfunctional for a long period of time from oxidative stress, inflammation, or immune system imbalance, then they eventually will die if there's no treatment uh, provided to them to help rescue them, as it were. Now, those three on the top, oxidative stress, inflammation, and immune system dysregulation, they, as far as we know, participate in every age-related disease you may consider, right? And so many of the nutraceuticals and or other compounds being developed, uh, traditional drugs as well, they can influence those. And so those types of nutrients or nutraceuticals that we can ingest or take, right, are very important in terms of our overall health and uh, postponing, right, uh, the possible development of a disease state. So let me say it in a different way. In other words, most, uh, uh, um, uh, most fruits and vegetables contain compounds that actually affect inflammation, oxidative stress, and modulate the immune system. Now, that sounds pretty amazing, right? Uh, and it is at one level. Uh, I know for myself, uh, that was quite an a, a interesting revelation as uh, my own lab some years ago had identified a set of nutraceuticals. And when we saw that they had those three properties, at first, I thought, geez, this sounds like uh, molecular snake oil. But as I started to read more about nutritional biochemistry and the compounds, the nutraceuticals that we had discovered for dry MD, it turns out this appears to be 
quite quite well conserved in many uh, fruits and vegetables that we consume, and even other herbs and so on. And that's another uh, lovely, fascinating uh, topic to consider at some point. Uh, that in in many traditional uh, cultures or uh, medical systems like Indian Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Russian, South American medicine, there are a set of compounds or herbs uh, and plants that have been discovered that although ostensibly on the outside they, they appear different, though the active ingredients exert the same biological activity. In other words, they, they affect oxidative stress, they're antioxidants, they're anti-inflammatory agents, and they modulate the immune system. That's pretty remarkable. So in other words, these, these uh, traditional healthcare uh, cultures, as it were, uh, African medicines too, uh, by the way, um, they've discovered through trial and error, historical trial and error, or if you'd like to call them historical clinical trials, these types of herbs and plants. And it's been really quite fun for myself uh, to talk to uh, experts in the field um, who spent their lifetime studying this. Uh, to me, it was a revelation. For other people, it was fairly, it's, it was common knowledge. But it's quite remarkable that nature has these types of compounds available for us to ingest freely <laughs> in, our, in our food. Next slide. Okay, so now how do we go about evaluating a patient that may come to see us? Uh, these are the, the uh, types of um, assessments we do in clinic. Uh, next slide, and we'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't have to, uh, the opportunity to look in the back of a human eye, this is the left eye, so the nose is off to your left in this case, uh, and the uh, ear is off to your right of the slide. Um, in the middle, that pinkish structure is the optic nerve. Remember, that's the cable that carries light information from the eye to the back of the head. And you can see the blood vessels coursing through the retina. The retina, remember, is a clear structure, and you can't actually see it. The pigmentation that you see, that orangish-red color, actually comes from those nourishing cells, um, because they're pigmented, and some other uh, pigmented cells that are found uh, in the back of the eye or underneath the retina. Now, you may notice that there's this uh, darker orangish-red structure um, in the middle. That is called the macula, and the dead center of that is where we see 2020 from. And you can also appreciate, if you look carefully at this, uh, this slide, this is actually of a human, uh, a normal uh, left eye of a patient, um, that there's no blood vessels there. Uh, and that's another interesting conversation why that is, but it turns out in order to pack those visual cells at higher density, Mother Nature terminated the blood vessels a uh, slightly uh, before uh, that dead center area so that we could have high visual acuity in that region. That's also the region, by the way, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where the pigments from green and yellow vegetables collect, right? Uh, there's specific receptors that are found for the so-called carotenoids like lutein and zeaxanthine. And the reason why they collect there is because of the entire retina, that is the most metabolically active region, the macula. And the mac because of that, it generates tremendous free radicals. And lutein and zeaxanthine and other carotenoids are potent antioxidants. So Mother Nature has designed that to protect that area, knowing that uh, there was a trade-off be between, between having very, very high central visual acuity, me increased metabolic activity, and then on the other hand, to, to protect against it is by, by placing these carotenoids uh, that we ingest in green and yellow vegetables. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So what are the symptoms of macular degeneration? There can be loss of central vision, blurring of the vision, or distortion of the vision. Next slide. For example, here's a, 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 to the left a patient with normal vision. This what uh, you would see these, uh, these uh, uh, cute little young boys uh, with their balls. Uh, a patient with macular degeneration, that central region would be blurred out. But as you may appreciate, the peripheral retina or peripheral vision appears pretty darn good, and that is the case. So patients with macular degeneration, even the severe form, 
never lose peripheral vision. In other words, the eye doesn't go black per se, but the central vision can be affected as, as shown here. Next slide, please. How, what, what, what else may they, they experience? This is an Amstler grid. I'm sure some of the listeners are aware of this. Uh, in the upper box, uh, that's what um, all of us who have normal vision experience. All the lines vertically and horizontally are straight. In, in the lower to, uh, to lower left, you can see there's a little graying area and a distortion of the grid boxes. And, in a, and or to the right, there can be graying or sometimes even whiting out of regions of, uh, of, of, of central vision. And this is the kind of testing that we've asked patients to do at home. And if they notice these changes that are shown in the, in the bottom two boxes, uh, we, we ask them to immediately call us and come in and see us as uh, eye doctors and retina specialists. Next slide, please. In addition, next slide. Here are some pictures. Uh, this is just to re refresh everyone's um, memory of what a, a normal retina looks like. This is a left eye. Again, optic nerve in the middle, the blood vessels coursing through the retina, and that orangish red region in the center is our macula. Next slide. Here is a patient uh, at higher resolution uh, of a right eye. So the right ear is over to the left and the nose is over to the right. You can see the optic nerve. Now you can see those yellowish debris deposits throughout the retina. These are called drusen. They're inflammatory debris deposits found underneath the retina. And this is the kind of picture uh, that we would see uh, when we actually examine a patient uh, at the microscope, uh, the slit lamp in clinic. Next slide, please. And here's a patient with wet macular degeneration. This is a left eye now. And you can appreciate in the left picture, you can see some blood. That blood is actually underneath the retina. And you can see uh, in the right picture, now you don't see any blood, but what appears to be this yellowish region. And that region is actually a scar for, uh, from bleeding that was uncontrolled. Uh, in that eye. By the way, these days it's extremely rare to see a patient like that. We do still see them as retina specialists, in part because over the last decade we've had these wonderful new medicines uh, that stop those leaky blood vessels that uh, indeed has revolutionized the way we manage patients with wet macular degeneration. Next slide, please. In clinic, so uh, I showed you some pictures or the kinds of um, uh, images that we might see on actual examination of the retina at the microscope. There's other tests we do as well. Next slide, please. A fluorescein angiogram is one of those. In this test, we inject an, uh, a dye. Um, actually, uh, this, this dye led to a Nobel Prize in 1905 to a German, uh, uh, German chemist named Breyer. Um, but in any case, that dye is injected through an IV, and we can take pictures of the retina and the blood vessels in the retina. And in the left picture, you can see it's labeled normal. Um, again, uh, you can see the op or at least part of the optic nerve. And you can see in the dead center good vision, it's, it's pretty much jet black there. That's normal. In the left eye, in the, sorry, the right picture, of a right eye, you can see now this large region, whitish region, that's abnormal leaky blood vessels underneath the retina. And this is to confirm the diagnosis of wet macular degeneration in this patient. Next slide, please. Now, in addition, uh, besides uh, directly examining patients, doing fluorescein angiograms, we can also do imaging. And these imaging techniques, which have also been around for about a decade or so, they also have revolutionized diagnostically how we evaluate patients with retinal diseases. Uh, it's called OCT imaging, or optical coherence tomography. You don't need to remember that mouthful. But let me show you some pictures. Next slide. Uh, here's an instrument, um, uh, the kind of instrument that we as retina specialists use in clinic. Next slide, please. It's a non-invasive test, 
And let me just orient you uh, as you look at this. This is a non-invasive image. So light is coming from the top of the slide down. It's as though the patient is lying on their back. You can see in red where I've marked the retina. And what's remarkable, remember I'd shown those microscopic uh, image uh, early on in this presentation? We can resolve, resolve uh, essentially to microscopic resolution the structures of the retina with these types of images. Now you can see the retina there, that dip is called the fovea. It's no bigger than the tip of a pen. And that's where all of us see 2020 from. Now you, you can also appreciate these various bands, the bright bands, there's one, two, three, four that you can see there uh, near the edge of, or the bottom side of the retina. We even know what those are. Uh, I won't go into those today, uh, but they can be used prognostically because we know what cell layers they represent which is just absolutely remarkable to me. Um, below it you, is the eye wall itself, beyond that lowest white band. And you can see this, it looks like there's, uh, there's little chunks in there. Uh, that's actually the choroid, that very, very large blood supply. So we can even image this amazing blood supply within the retina uh, using this type of high resolution imaging of the retina. Next slide, please. So this is a normal eye. So I hope you might remember what that looks like with the dip. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is just simply to show you that the image that we, we can uh, collect in clinic, shown on the right, actually directly correlates with a histological sample, which is shown on the left. Uh, now, again, you don't need to remember um, these layers, but there's nine layers of the retina, and we can determine exactly in which layer a disease may be affecting and then monitor it and use it to determine whether our treatments are actually impacting uh, vision and those layers that may be disrupted. Next slide, please. Here is an example of a patient with dry macular degeneration. Again, light is coming from the top of the slide downwards. And what you can appreciate right away, it's, there's this lumpy, bumpy, uh, appearance to that lower layer of the retina. And that's those yellow inflammatory debris deposits that I had shown in the color photographs. So we can actually see where this material is. And we know that in certain instances that if it's large enough, it can actually disrupt the visual cell layer, which is shown here, but I, I won't point it out at this point in time. So this is a patient with dry macular degeneration. Next slide, please. Here, uh, here's another example that I've just changed the contrast um, uh, from the images collected from the, that device. And you can see in now in black, the lumpy, bumpy material, this, these so-called drusen. And we can in fact map what we see on, on photographs, which is shown to the right, uh, sorry, to the left, with these kinds of uh, OCT images, which are shown to the right. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a patient with wet macular degeneration, and you can tell right away, well, geez, this looks different. First of all, you can see that black space, that large black space is fluid that's collected underneath the retina. That's from the leaky blood vessels that are growing underneath this patient's retina. And that fluid is what we're very fortunate to treat with, with some of our uh, these new medicines that cause uh, that stop those leaky blood vessels. Now, um, um, Cheryl, I'm going to pass. Uh, I just looked at the time. It's already 11:41. Uh, let me pass on uh, next slide. I'm going to pass through these slides. Next, 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 next. Okay. Um, I'm going to now uh, uh, briefly talk about um, uh, this one last test and then uh, talk about treatments. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now, what do doctors do? What all of us as physicians do is only two things, really, uh, regardless of the doctor. We measure structure and we measure function, whether it's a kidney doctor, a heart doctor, brain doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, or someone like myself, a retina specialist. So far, I've shown you ways of how we actually measure structure. We directly look at it, take those images, and so on. 
Now, how do we measure function? Well, yes, we can measure vision in clinic, but we can also do a test. This is called micropermetry, where we project really small dots of light in that area of central good vision. And by doing so, we can look at the sensitivity of that region by changing the intensity of the light and asking the patient to respond. Here, for example, is a normal patient. All these uh, circles are green because this is normal retinal sensitivity. Next slide, please. And in a patient, for example, with early or severe dry macular degeneration, as you can see in the right-hand panels, uh, there are more yellow dots and in the lower panel, red and orange dots. What those yellow and red and orange dots mean is that the retina in those regions is much less sensitive on the order of 100 to 10,000 fold less sensitive than a patient who's normal, that's shown on the uh, left. So this is a way to measure function in that area of dead center good vision. Because at the end of the day, really what, what all of us are concerned about uh, is our central good vision. Yes, we do use our peripheral vision to a certain degree, and yes, in certain diseases like glaucoma and retinitis pigment, pigmentosa, the peripheral vision can be affected, but it's that central vision that really allows us to carry out our uh, activities. And so this is a way to, as I mentioned, to measure function in the retina itself. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Now, um, uh, for those of you who are um, keen to write down or, or look for some recommendations, this is the slide um, that I, I would uh, um, you should consider maybe taking some notes from. Um, one is to take a good multivitamin with the B complex. We know that the B complex can help reduce inflammation uh, and also uh, there are potent antioxidants in a good multivitamin, and it also helps in energy production. And as it turns out, uh, there have been studies that sh have showed that with age, uh, in, all over our body, but in the retina in particular, there is a, a decline in energy production. And that may be related to nutrition per se, but it could be just age-related inefficiencies of how a cell works. Um, but this is one uh, recommendation that we encourage patients to take on, is a good multivitamin with a B complex. The second one I've mentioned in passing already is to take fish oil or other sources of omega-3 fats, right? Uh, the omega-3 fats, as many of you know, are anti-inflammatory uh, in, in contradistinction to the omega-6 fats, which are uh, pro-inflammatory. Um, Cheryl? Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> Our pro-inflammatory. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. It turns out not only are the omega-3 fats anti-inflammatory, they have amazing biological uh, effects, by the way. Um, they have been shown to actually protect the visual cells in the eye, uh, in the retina in particular, and the cells of the brain. Uh, so, and they slightly uh, thin the blood as well, so one has to be careful when taking fish oil. Uh, there's other very interesting biological activities of the omega-3 fats, but that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Reducing omega-6 is encouraged. Uh, the omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory, and anything that has processed food in it uh, typically is enriched in omega-6 fats. So we want to reduce the consumption, not make it go to zero, Right, because we do need a certain degree of omega-6 fats, and not uh, without going into the the biochemistry of it all, the omega-6 fats are in to some degree in equilibrium with the omega-3 fats. I should point out in the average American diet, over the last 30, 40 years, there has been a precipitous rise in the omega-6 consumption and a precipitous decrease in the omega-3 consumption. Interestingly, the incidence of uh, macular degeneration, cancer, hypertension, obesity, uh, diabetes have also risen dramatically uh, in the United States uh, as a consequence. Uh, the, the next point is vitamin D. Now, we think of it as a vitamin. It, it, it is a vitamin at one level uh, or, or qualifies biochemically as a vitamin, but it, it's also, it turns out to be a hormone. It's, a, it's the backbone 
um, or can participate in many different biochemical activities. There is a review written some years ago to suggest that low levels of vitamin D or the active form called 25-hydroxy-D3 uh, have been associated with at least 40 human diseases. Uh, including macular degeneration, by the way. So it's important to get a, a vitamin D3 or 25-hydroxy-D3 level checked uh, in patients. Uh, and if it is low, even here in Florida where I live, um, many patients have low vitamin D3 levels. In fact, you have to be out in the sun quite a bit, uh, probably more more than uh, is comfortable for most of us, to to have sufficient quantities of vitamin D3. Uh, or 25-hydroxy uh, D3. Um, so it's good to get it checked and potentially supplement it. Eating lots of green and yellow vegetables, I mentioned this in passing already. There was a beautiful study, um, about two European study, that showed that consuming kale can potentially stop and in some instances may even improve vision in patients with dry macular degeneration. Remember the carotenoids found in green and yellow vegetables uh, known as lutein and zeaxanthin. There's other carotenoids too, by the way, but those are the, the two predominant ones found in the macula. Um, they, they are important, they serve as important antioxidants. Eating lots of dark fruits, darker the fruit, the better, right? Blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, red grapes, pomegranate, plums, cherries, right? All of those have potent antioxidants, uh, and those antioxidants, again, they're very important for the body, uh, they're important for the brain and the retina as well. Next slide, please. Now here is, uh, I'm just going to run through some pictures. Here's, here's the fish oil that I take, and uh, um, uh, it's, uh, I just... And what, this is what's great about cell phones, right? You can take out your camera and take a picture. Uh, next slide. Um, other sources of omega-3 fats are uh, almonds, pecans, walnuts. Uh, beans also are, are loaded with omega-3 fats. Now, there's specific, without, again, going into the biochemical sp uh, details, um, the, the omega-3 fats that are found in fish oil can be directly processed or used by cells in the body. The types of omega-3 fats that are found in these, uh, these types of uh, uh, nuts um, has to be processed. They're less efficiently converted to what are known as DHA and EPA, the ones that can be directly utilized from fish oil. So what we recommend patients to, to take fish oil, and uh, the amount uh, depends on the size of the patient and so on. Next slide. Here is an example of kale and broccoli. Uh, both of them are wonderful foods to consume. Uh, in fact, uh, one can make all sorts of, there's, uh, that's another great thing about the web. There's wonderful recipes that, uh, for making soups or dishes out of either of these. Uh, and here, for example, is another potent antioxidant, goji berries. Uh, it's loaded with lycopene, which is a potent antioxidant. Next slide, please. I know I have to finish up. Um, here is wet macular degeneration in which there are leaky blood vessels. I was mentioning to you uh, earlier that there are uh, these potent injections. We numb up and sterilize the eye, and we can, injection, we can inject these types of medicines to stop those leaky blood vessels. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide. Uh, here is an example of a patient uh, with wet macular degeneration. You can see that black cystic area before and after treatment. It's gone away. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and so in, I, I just wanted to reemphasize the importance of oxidative stress, inflammation, immune system dysregulation, which then affects vision by, by leading to the death of visual cells. These top three can be affected profoundly uh, by nutrition and nutraceuticals that we consume. Next slide. Um, next slide. 
I noticed the time, Cheryl, that I, um, that's my last slide, actually. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, uh, please, uh, happy to, to, to chat with people about it. Uh, um, I love my family first, and I intensely enjoy uh, talking, taking care of patients and talking about retina and vision uh, biochemistry. Uh, thank you very much. I know I passed through some of those slides. Uh, they were less important, but if people had questions that, that they'd like me to to discuss, I'm happy to do so. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Kaushal. I was um, I'm absolutely amazed at some of the facts and figures that you gave us about, uh, for example, the the um, amount of blood supply uh, percentage-wise in the retina. I think that we're all going to think differently about our eyes and treat them like the incredibly important tissue that they are. Um, I have a lot of questions here. Um, so I'm going to kind of cut through some of them. One of the first was I got from two different individuals saying that because of, you mentioned inflammation, what about the use of curcumin for uh, helping with some of the issues? <laughs> Cheryl, so I, you, 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 pro you probably chuckled when you saw that one. <laughs> I did. I absolutely did, yes. <laughs> so Cheryl and I have been talking uh, about uh, possibly uh, doing, uh, uh, would like to do a clinical study uh, curcumin, I, I do mention it. To, I didn't mention it in specific here. Potent antioxidant, potent anti-inflammatory agent. It has other very interesting biological properties in the retina. What I tell folks to do is, um, uh, for the moment, uh, in the absence of a rigorous clinical study, is to take about a gram or so a day. Um, that's uh, from other studies, uh, not in the eye, but in other uh, clinical studies using uh, um, uh, turmeric, uh, that's, that would be a, a reasonable place to start. Excellent. And then I have a question here about, which I have this question as well. Uh, does staring at screens, phones, computers, television damage vision? That's a great question. I, I get asked that a lot. No, not Do really. You? People have actually looked. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. So excessive light exposure can affect retinal function. For sure. But like, for example, um, you and I are staring at uh, computer monitors. That won't do it, or uh, most of us who are, um, are listening to this presentation. That, that doesn't really have an effect, per se, on the retina. Well, along with that, I had a couple of other questions that are saying, uh, what, what happens, why is it when you get older that you have increased light sensitivity, that, you know, that, you, that... your eyes find more <laughs> bright light? Yeah, so that's a more complicated answer. <laughs> There's okay. multiple things that are that, that are occurring. Well, one is our lenses. Uh, well, I mentioned the tear film, right? So the tear film is changing with age biochemically, um, and the way light strikes the tear film and the way it's being bent from the tear film passing through the cornea. That's one. Second, the lens is also becoming less clear in, in some patients. It develop it becomes a pacified, and that's what we call a cataract right? That also can affect light sensitivity. And then the retina is changing. So there's many different biological changes that are occurring that can affect the eye and affect the sensitivity to light. In general, however, this has been well studied uh, by vision biologists over the years, that uh, the retinal sensitivity declines with age. That's well known. But this sensitivity to outside bright light can be a combination of these other factors. Excellent. Wonderful to know. Um, let's see. People are saying if you're in the initial stages, is it a, might it be enough to do some of these uh, dietary changes and nutraceuticals enough to help stall the progression? So that's one of the things we want to study. Um, there are some studies. Some of the uh, some of the listeners may be aware of these so-called ocular vitamins, which are essentially they're really antioxidants. Uh, they, they have been validated through very large clinical style, uh, uh, trials. Sorry, uh, sponsored by the National Eye Institute, uh, the so-called ARADS one and the ARADS two studies. Uh, the ARADS two sh studies really showed uh, the uh, the importance or the efficacy of these carotenoids are found in green and yellow vegetables. Um, the ARADS-2 study didn't show the effect of uh, fish oil. 
And uh, to many of us, we scratched our heads when the results came out last year. I, I think there's some caveats uh, without going into the details of the study. That needs to be reexamined more carefully. Uh, there's multiple reasons why the effect may have not been noted. It was not known in the placebo patients how much fish oil they were taking. Uh, secondly, the actual tissue levels uh, of omega-3 fats, which can be determined by uh, blood testing was not determined. And also the, the one gram that uh, patients were supplemented with, it may be that they need higher amounts uh, than that. Uh, for example, in some very lovely work in the Alzheimer's field, higher doses of fish oil appeared to, in some instances, stop and or reverse uh, changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. Here's a question about cataracts, and we didn't really talk about cataracts, but I actually yeah. have two or three questions on that. Um, one of them has to do with the dietary uh, recommendations that you made for macular degeneration. Might those are those also useful for cataracts? Well, one, and one, second, uh, so and the, the second yeah. piece is as yes. as astaxanthin specifically useful for cataract prevention. <laughs> uh, so I'm quite familiar with astaxanthin. It's a very interesting antioxidant. Um, so the answer is. The, 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 there is no rigorous studies yet to show the effect of these uh, in cataracts. Does it make good sense? Um, is it biologically plausible uh, to take them to potentially slow down the development of cataracts? Yes. Yes, there is. Uh, because the same changes that are occurring in a cataractous lens are quite similar to what are occurring in the retina and other uh, age-related diseases. Now, um, I, I, on the flip side, it's very interesting because cataract surgery and the technology around it is so good these days. Uh, the uh, cataract operations usually don't take much more than uh, 10 minutes or so these days. There's not a lot of research being done because the removal of a cataract is so easy, actually almost anywhere on the planet, really, uh, nowadays. Um, but yes, I, I think that it's not unreasonable to take uh, these nutritional supplements. Uh, again, there are no rigorous trials to show uh, their e efficacy in cataracts per se, but it, it, it's given that they're the safety of these, uh, these nutraceuticals, I, I think it's reasonable to do that. You know, there was a, a, a nur the Nurses' Health Study too through um, Harvard School of Public Health looking at diet in the people that are participating in the development of cataracts found that people who took vitamin C as a supplement at a specific yep. level had yes. much lower risk for cataracts long term. So it does yes. seem as that an there antioxidant. is some, yes. right, that there's some anti that antioxidants are are of value and we should be eating more antioxidants anyway. So Correct. <laughs> it's good for other exactly. things as well. Uh, That's here right. I have I have another question having to do with those nutritional interventions and the dietary supplements that you're recommending and that sort of thing. Uh, are they useful for other retinal diseases, especially diabetic retinopathy? Yes. So, uh, in fact, uh, those are the same recommendations we make for that, right, for diabetic retinopathy. Because in diabetic retinopathy, similar types of changes are occurring, uh, you know, the inflammation, the oxidative stress. Um, there are other uh, changes that are also occurring in diabetic retinopathy. I didn't cover that in specific. But, uh, again, it's very reasonable to imp uh, for the improvement of the function of the retina and the brain and, the, and other tissues to do those types of recommendations that I had pointed out in that slide. Now, again, um, I, I say that with a caveat. Are there rigorous studies to demonstrate that? No. Uh, we're, we're very keen, uh, myself and my colleagues, to do those kinds of studies to provide, you know, um, compelling clinical evidence uh, for that. But uh, as I said, it's, it's not unreasonable to take those uh, for diabetic retinopathy as well. Obviously, the fruits one has to be more careful about because you don't want the blood sugars rising uh, significantly, but at least in, in moderate quantities, uh, some, uh, some fruits, dark fruits. Excellent. Um, we have a couple questions I want to try to squeeze in here. One is, uh, do dry eyes contribute to AMD? No. They're, they're, what's interesting is um, some of the biochemical changes that occur with dry eyes are exactly the same biochemical changes that occur in the retina in macular degeneration. But no, dry eyes do not contribute to macular degeneration. 
And is the dry form hereditary? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, approximately, um, I, I believe um, most of us would feel comfortable saying about 75% of AMD is hereditary. And a whole set of genes and the changes in those genes have been identified. There's, uh, um, and that number continues to increase as we continue to identify them as a field. Uh, yes, so yes, it is hereditary. In fact, uh, uh, myself and many others around the country, uh, we do genetic testing uh, uh, of patients in clinic to identify a set of those genes because it turns out those are useful, uh, that kind of testing is useful in both sharing with the patient but also understanding what the risk is of developing the more severe forms of macular degeneration. So then perhaps at a much younger age, you can start to think about prevention. Correct. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Here is a lady who uses in her job a low-level laser. Is there any yeah. danger as long as she wears goggles? Um, I saw that. Uh, I think that's reasonable to do, right? Uh, now, you have to make sure the goggles or the, the filters in the goggles uh, protect against that, against that laser light. I assume they do, right? Um, but yes, um, with appropriate eye protection, uh, it's, it's okay to use lasers. In fact, as, as a retina specialist and a surgeon, we use lasers both in clinic and uh, in the operating room, and we have special filters that protect our eyes when we're treating our patients. Oh, excellent. So if, as long as they're a, a filter that blocks some of the... You know, yeah, the, the correct the, wavelength right. of, of, right. of, the, of the laser. Um, we also have a question, what are the causative factors for developing these drusen deposits? And yeah, what are they so again, it's yeah, inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysregulation, uh, what I had mentioned uh, earlier. And, you know, I, I just want to bring this up briefly. We've, uh, I think we've managed most um, of the questions, and I know we're a little bit over on time, but you had shared something with me that I think makes tremendous is is it tremendously important? And you said that per um, per volume, the retina has the highest level of cholesterol in the body. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. Uh, those those visual cells they're loaded with cholesterol. And that we don't know for sure, but that maybe this aggressive attempt to reduce cholesterol to very very low levels might be having an adverse effect long term on vision. Uh, uh, and brain, for that matter, too. Uh, absolutely. And uh, that needs to be more, uh, more carefully examined um, because now there's essentially a generation of folks who have been on these uh, uh, cholesterol-lowering medicines. Uh, and could that be participating in this increased rise, uh, not only in macular degeneration, but other retinal diseases like diabetes and diabetic retinopathy? Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for your participation, and thank you, Dr. Kauschel, for staying over a little bit. We certainly do appreciate it, and um, every time I listen to you, I learn something new. So thank you, thank you for sharing this information. And uh, thank you to all pleasure. of our attendees. Thank you, and thank you to all of our attendees for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about uh, how nutrients impact the eye, the etiology of especially the macular degenerations, what causes them to learn more about how the, how the eye functions. Uh, we appreciate it if you have any questions. Um, I mean, if you want to call Dr. Kauschel uh, for questions or appointments, we have the phone number listed on the screen. Um, and if you have any specific questions for us, you can contact us at terrytalksnutrition.com, and there is a place where you can submit questions. And if you would like to sign up for our weekly health newsletter, natural health newsletter, you can also do so at terrytalksnutrition.com which is the sponsor of this webinar, and we promise to treat your email with great consideration, and we never share, so uh, we will only send to you the once-weekly health newsletter if you are so inclined to subscribe. So thank you again, everyone, to your participation, and until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye. Bye, Cheryl. -bye. Bye,